Welcome to Bible study tonight, uh, New Testament Christian Church, Shreveport in Bossier City, Louisiana. We're glad that you could join us on this live stream of our Bible study tonight. We are in 1 John chapter 3, and it's a blessing to be serving a God who reigns sovereign over all things. And we can trust in him to watch over us, and we can trust in him never to back down from the things that he's given us as truth in his word. He's a God that never changes, and I am thankful for that. Because so much of what we uh, what we need from him is that consistency. And, he, and that's one of the things that John is writing about here in 1 John is the consistency of God and how we can have that relationship and the consistency of our life in that relationship with God is demonstrated in those same characteristics that God is so consistent in, his righteousness and love. So we can be thankful that God gives us his word unchanging that we can see whenever we're concerned about events going on in the world and the world changes. You know, history has has ebbs and flows and there's circumstances that that come and go and people that rise and fall, but God is always God. So we are in Bible study tonight, chapter three of first John. And as we get started this evening, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have your word to guide us and to give us confidence in your love and in your righteousness and in the salvation that we have in you through Jesus Christ. We pray that you would guide us through your word tonight, God, that we can know all that you would have for us to learn to live for you that life of consistency in righteousness and love in that relationship with you that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are thankful that you could join us this evening, and we think the, or we hope that uh, besides just the live streaming that we've got going on for Bible study and also the live streaming that we have for our Sunday morning services at 1030 on Sunday mornings, that if you're nearby, that you could come and join us in person. We meet at 2328 Barksdale Boulevard in Bossier City, Louisiana, at the, the name of the building, the name of the facility that we're using is Sissy's Playhouse. And we hope that you'll come and join us. Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. And so we are going to heed the word of God and meet together as we have the opportunities because doing so encourages us. It's it's a faith building thing to get together with people who are serving God also, people whose whose lives have been changed by God and we can look at our own selves and say I've still got so far to go in my own life. Uh one man told me one time he said I'm I'm not the man that I used to be or he said I'm not the man that I ought to be but thank God I'm not the man that I used to be. And we can all look at ourselves and consider that as true for ourselves. And when we consider ourselves with that humility, then we're not going to be going around finding fault with other people as we see there's also things that God's working on in their lives, perhaps. But we do get together. We worship together. We praise the Lord together. We get into the Bible together. We get the preaching of the word of God. The spirit of God is present. So please come and join us if you're able to on Sunday mornings, 1030 for our services at 2328 Barksdale Boulevard in Bossier City, Louisiana into the Bible study tonight. We started uh, into chapter three last week. And so this week we're going to pick up with verse three, where it says, every man that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And what we were looking about through chapter two and into the very first verses here of chapter three was that hope that we have in resurrection, in eternal life, in getting to spend that time eternally with God and his presence, being glorified. Even as Jesus was raised from the dead, we know that we will be raised from the dead as we believe in Jesus and to be glorified, to be like him. So everyone that has the hope of eternal life with Jesus purifies himself even as he is pure. And that flows from that previous statement that John was making about the hope of eternal life into this next statement that he's making about living in righteousness, where he says in verse four, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for this for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him 
sinneth not. He's talking about abiding in God, abiding in that relationship that we have with God. Again, John wrote 1 John so that we can know that we can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, through salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. And that that relationship is characterized in our lives in righteousness and love. So here he's really talking about righteousness being that uh, freedom from sin, righteousness being the absence of sin in our lives, because just as God is pure, the Bible says here in uh, chapter one, he said, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And as he says here in uh, verse six of chapter three, that we abide in him, now, let me ask the question that I asked when we were in chapter one. If God is light and in him is no darkness at all, if there's any darkness in us, does that mean that we are in him? It doesn't work that way. But look at what he says about our lives and our righteousness that we have through Jesus Christ. He said that he was manifested to take away our sins. Praise God that we're forgiven and delivered from our sins. In him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. And I'll bring it up again that one of the blessings of having these live stream videos and the videos that you can go back and see again is that you can go back and you can follow up on the Bible studies up to this point. If you missed them, you can also go back and watch some of the church services that we have. And I would encourage you to go back and watch this Sunday's that we just had church service, which I think was uh, November 1st. And we're talking about that. We're talking about how God, Jesus Christ, was manifested to destroy the works of the devil and how that is accomplished in the lives of those who believe on him. Continuing on, verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifested, that means made known. In this the children of God are manifested, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So what he's talking about is that nature of sin that we were born with, when we're born again through Jesus Christ by faith in him and made a child of God, we are not of that nature anymore. The sin nature is not who we are. It does not define us. It's gone. Even as Paul wrote in the book of Romans in chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. Our old man is crucified. The person that I used to be is not who I am anymore. The person who I was when I came to Christ is no more. That old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if Christ be dead, we believe that we shall. Uh, now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once unto sin. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves. Now here's where it's getting down to. It's more than just knowing that he died and rose again. But it's about my life in him being completely changed by the fact that he died for my sins and rose again. Because I believe that the person who I was died with him. 
But by my faith in him, I am born again. Even in Isaiah chapter 53, where it's talking about the, the transgressions or the weight of our transgressions or the penalty of our transgressions. It was upon him. He took my sins to the cross. He died for me, for my sins. And when he rose again, that gives me the hope of everlasting life through him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once unto sin. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So likewise ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. That means don't do it. Don't use your hands to commit sin anymore. Don't use your eyes to commit sin anymore. Yield not your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. As those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness, use your hands, use the capacities that God gives you to do righteousness instead of sin and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God for sin shall not have dominion over you for sin shall not have dominion over you. This is the meaning of holiness. It means that we are separated from the corruption of sin. It means that we live in righteousness unto God. That word holy means separated for God's righteous purpose. And we are separated from our sins. We are no longer who we used to be. We're no longer part of the world. We're no longer part of that corruption. We've been made holy by our faith in God. That sin nature was crucified on the cross. That old man is dead, but we raised because we're born again. That's why he said in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God who has reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ. We died to that old life, but we now live in newness of life, in righteousness, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We become a child of God rather than a child of the devil. We were born in that sin nature, following after sin. It was our natural inclination to sin. Nobody has to teach a child how to lie. Nobody has to coach a child, say this, if you don't want to get in trouble for doing the wrong thing. First of all, they know that what they did was wrong. Second of all, they know that saying that they didn't do it is wrong. Nobody has to teach them that because it's part of who we are by birth. Deceive us. Uh, Whatever the word is, uh, I, I'm going to pull a politician and just make a, a tongue slip and, and not pronounce the word correctly. But being uh, deceitful is natural by birth. Doing the wrong thing is natural by birth. OK, and I'll tell you this. Nobody has to tell the child that it's wrong to lie also because that fear of being caught is with them when they tell the lie. Because they know it's wrong. They don't want to be called out for it. But when we're born again, that nature of sin that we were born naturally in is crucified. It's done away with. We are born again. We're a new creature in Jesus Christ. And our way of life changes accordingly. Because we no longer live in the sinfulness that once defined us. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed, God's seed, remains in him. It's not that seed of Adam that sin was passed unto us by, but it's the seed of God. We are his child now. His seed remaineth in us. And we cannot sin because we are born of God. That does not mean that we don't have the physical capabilities to sin. My hands can, can grab this glass of water and take a drink if I want to, just as capably as I could take something off a store shelf and stuff it in my pocket and shoplift and steal. It doesn't mean that we don't have the physical capabilities to do it. And it doesn't mean that we're impervious to temptation. But sinfulness is no longer our nature while acts of sin would remain a choice that's available to us, it's not who we are. We are offered sin through temptation. We say, I can't do that. Rather than just saying, oh, that seems like it would be fun. Or, oh, that would be a thrill to get away with something like that. Oh, the, the, the 
the anxiety, the, the, the pent up uh, fear of, of what's going to happen. Am I going to get caught or will there just be relief and, and a little bit of excitement from getting away with it? Oh, let's try it out. No, that's not who we are anymore. I can't do that. I can't do that. We realize that sin is a choice, but we make the choice to do righteousness instead of to do evil. Even sinners in the world, they can point out a hypocrite because they know that there are certain things that Christians just don't do. And you'll hear them say, a Christian shouldn't do that. And guess what? A lot of times they're right. Not that they're living right, but just that their observation is right because they know the difference between right and wrong, righteousness and wickedness. And when they see somebody doing something that's a characteristic of wickedness rather than righteousness, they'll say a Christian shouldn't be doing that. And we're not left to guess what these things are. We can be guided by the Holy Spirit whose conviction upon us will let us know if we're going towards something that's wrong. We can be led by the Holy Spirit whose conviction upon us will counteract the temptation that the devil would offer to us. But we're not just left to go on what we could write off as feelings. God's made it very clear in his word what is right and what is wrong. Paul wrote, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those are sexual sins, each one of them, to one degree or another, in one particular act or another, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, People asked me, or a, a man asked me one time, what is, what is variance? What is it? What is it to be unplacable and, and these other things that Paul talks about? You know, sometimes you are presented with something and there's a, a, a certain way to perceive it. And so you perceive it just as it's presented to you. And, and because you like the way that you have determined it to be, you hold on to that. And then you get somebody else that comes along and gives you more information and, and it counteracts what you already thought. And you want to argue against them when evidently everything is shown to you in truth. You just want to hold on to what you know to be deceitful simply because it's what you like now, simply because it was your own perception. You want to hold on to that and argue against and hold in contempt somebody that offers you the truth. That's variance. That's variance, emulations, that's pride and, and trying to one-up somebody. Wrath, strife, seditions, that's undermining authority. Heresies, that's preaching things that are untrue. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, reveling. And then he doesn't just cut off the list and say, that's all. As long as you're not doing one of the things that you can check off this list, then you're doing okay. No, he says, and such like. And such like. There's nowhere in the Bible that it gives us just a complete all-inclusive list. Don't do these things because we are led by the Spirit. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. We're led by the Spirit so that we know, yes, these are things that definitely are outside of what God considers to be righteous and holy. Yes, if we do any of these things, then we are wrong with God. But and such like means that I'm not even going to play around with these things that might imitate something like that. I'm not even going to follow after somebody who's involved in one of these things that just wants to get me caught up in one of their other schemes. I'm not going to play around with sin. I'm not going to get into that such like category myself because he says of the which I tell you before, as I have told you also in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. That means putting up with somebody for a long time. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. That means even when you've got a right that you could stand up for your right, you recognize that you asserting your right might put somebody else into a position of disadvantage. And so you meekly surrender your own rights in order that they may have an advantage. That's what Jesus did. 
Jesus had every right to remain in heaven, but he in meekness of spirit humbled himself and became a man and humbled himself even unto the death of the cross. But now he's exalted and he gives us that exaltation in him because he was so meek. Moses was meek when he could have remained in Egypt and enjoyed all of the pleasures that the greatest society in the world in that day could offer a young man. He said, no, I'm rather going to suffer with the people of God because I know that my asserting my right is going to disadvantage them. It's going to cause harm to them. And even when God told Moses, Moses, I'm just going to wipe out that nation of Israel because of their sinfulness. And I'll start over with you. God told Moses, I made a promise to Abraham, but I could still make that promise come through with you. Because you are of Abraham's seed. And Moses said, no, don't do it. If you're going to destroy them, destroy me also with them. Moses, in that meekness of spirit, said, I have a right. I can claim something of greatness. But my claiming that is going to mean harm to them? No, let me just seek after their own benefit. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ, again, have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts thereof. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. What we see are that the things that define the flesh are works. But the things that define a child of God is the spirit of God. And the fruit of the spirit is what he produces in our lives. We're guided by the Spirit. We walk with the Spirit. It doesn't mean that as soon as we kneel down at an altar of salvation and pray and rise up again, that we get everything right from that point in our lives. But what it does mean is that we are guided by the Spirit, by the Word of God. And we allow Him to work in our lives so that as we learn better, we do better. A brand new Christian on the day that they get saved, they're not going to have the Bible memorized. They're not going to know everything that there is to know about Christianity, but they're going to have the spirit of God to guide them, to show them this is right, to convict them if they go to something that is wrong. And by that, they can keep themselves living right. And then you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God working in you to accomplish his righteousness and his purpose in our lives. And what a blessing that is to be guided by the Spirit, to have the Spirit working within us. But even still, it's not a guarantee that we're going to get everything in our lives right after that because we make the choices. Because we have the capability to learn. And so God allows us to exercise that capability to learn in learning his word, in learning how to serve him better. It's like learning how to uh, play an instrument. Just because you can pluck out a couple of songs on the keyboard doesn't mean you've mastered the piano. And even somebody who would perform concerts and have people cheer for them and applaud at, at the mastery that they have reached, they'll still say, I've got so much more to go. And that's the same attitude that Paul the Apostle had. When he was serving God, he said, I claim not to have attained, but this one thing I do, I continue to press forward towards the mark, towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that's the attitude that we all must have, is that I'm not, I'm not the man that I ought to be yet. He's still working on me. He's still drawing me closer. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. But when we learn better, we do better. And there are things that we do learn of the word of God, things like modesty, things like tithing, things like uh, just living right, things like patience, things like long suffering. Say it's it's so easy just in my own flesh to, to get rid of something that's bothering me. But if God says this is making you stronger by the endurance that you're gaining through it, then I will be long suffering. Things like meekness, where it would be so easy of me just to stand up on my own and take everything that I need without being considerate of somebody else. But he's going to show us even here a couple verses down that we must be considerate of the needs of others, especially other Christians. Remember, John shows us that our life and our relationship with God, that consistency is shown with his will. Consistency with the will of God for our lives is shown in righteousness and also love. Verse 11, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not, of, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. 
Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Right from the very beginning of mankind, we see an example of those whose works are evil hating those whose works are good and righteous. Why? Because it makes them know their wickedness. It makes them know by sheer contrast that their works stand to be judged by God while the righteous one stands to be rewarded by God. And they can't take out their hatred on God directly. So what do they do? They take out their hatred on God's people. We should not expect the world to love us just because we live right. Just because we live right. Matter of fact, in our living right, we're going to get a whole category of individuals against us. But Paul wrote to Timothy, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, not maybe, not sometimes, not it could be during this period of time, but maybe not later on. But he said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Because the devil's always going to get people stirred up against God. And when they can't take it out on God directly, they'll take it out on God's people. So expect it. Expect it. But then at the same time, hold fast to that which is true. Don't let it take you out. That's how the devil would love to play it. Just give the Christian a hard time and make them stop believing in God. No. If Jesus could go all the way to the cross for me, I could go all the way for him by his strength. By his strength. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life. Again, he's talking about that old nature being dead and us being alive again through him in righteousness. We know that we have passed from that death unto life because we love the brethren. That characteristic of God's love working in our lives. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Who is our brother or our sister? A fellow child of God. A fellow child of God. Anybody who's a Christian, in this sense, is the brother or sister of anybody else who's a Christian. Now, there are some people who would say, and maybe you've said it before, maybe you've heard other people say it, we're all God's children. No, we're not. We are. I am. My brother Brooks sitting here at the table next to me. I believe he is. My wife's sitting over there. I believe she is. Okay. As Christians, we are the children of God. But to just make it all inclusive of the whole world and say, we're all God's children. Let's all sing Kumbaya. No, we're not all God's children. He just covered that. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifested and the children of the devil. You're in one family or the other. And the children of God are those that are born again, dead to their sins, living unto God in his righteousness. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. Okay, again, it's that meekness. It's that meekness that says, I might have a right. I might be able to claim something of myself. But if my claiming something for myself means that this other person is going to be harmed or disadvantaged, or I'm going to take an advantage over them, then I'll just forbear. I'll just be meek. I'll just say, okay, well, we can enjoy this together. And guess what? God rewards that. He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. You're not losing anything for giving up something in this world for God. There's nothing that you can give up in this world for God that God will not bless you abundantly over for. The meek shall inherit the earth. We got, you know, it's an interesting time. Just 2020 has been an interesting time. Okay. And just today and yesterday are interesting times as the elections playing out. And I'm not going to come down on one side or the other here, but what would it be? If one of the politicians stood up and said, you know what, just for the good of the country, we don't know who the winner is yet, but just for the good of the country, I'm going to go ahead and, and withdraw myself. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And perhaps in, in one regard, it should not happen because the people get to have their say. 
But what would it be if a Christian said, now, wait a second, wait a second. If it's between you and me, I can go ahead and step aside. I can go ahead and, and not make a big deal out of it, not use my uh, magnanimity of, of, of being meek. Because if there's not humility, then it's not meekness. I'm not going to lord it over you that I've allowed you to have something. I'm just going to kind of quietly not assert myself so that this person can have what they need rather than me just getting and getting and getting everything that I want. We're not losing anything when we do that because the meek shall inherit the earth. Just like the politicians are trying to get control of the country, God's people are going to inherit the earth. Following that up, though, he said, but whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother in need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And just like our faith, where James wrote that faith without works is dead, so love without showing your love doesn't mean anything. He said, don't just go around saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. But show a person that you love them. Love is demonstrated in action, just like our faith is lived out in action, not just words. And we don't need to complicate these verses here and say, oh, let's let's split up the circumstances and, and let's consider all of the, the things that might come into play here. No, let's not. Let's take God at his word and love one another, be willing to help one another in Christ. Okay, that's what we're called to do. Our faith and our love are demonstrated in actions. But let me also say this. Don't take words for granted. Don't just go around saying, oh, because, because I love you, I wash the dishes. And so I don't need to tell you that I care about you. I don't need to tell you that I love you. Because words certainly even in our faith, we worship, we praise God, we tell him that we love him, okay? As we're living and loving one another, we also ought to speak kindly towards one another. It may not always get those mushy, sentimental feelings that we would give towards somebody that we're in a closer relationship with, but just let people know, hey, I care about you. Hey, I care about you, and I want to help you if I can. If there's something that I can do, if there's something that I can offer to help you in this situation, because you are without, because you cannot do it yourself then if I can, I will. Not because I think you're trying to take advantage of me and not just because somebody holding up a cardboard sign that says anything helps God bless, but because I know this person is a child of God, because I've seen their life and I know that they have a need that I can help them with. Love is demonstrated in action, but don't take words for granted. Don't take words for granted. And we're going to close it right there. We'll continue on with chapter 3, finishing up chapter 3 next week. But don't take our opportunities to gather together for granted either. Because every opportunity that we have in God to do anything for God is an opportunity that God has given us to glorify him. And I'm going to tell you that again includes the opportunities that we have to meet together. It's rare and it's precious to have the opportunity to gather together in the name of God in freedom without fear. There are places in the world throughout history and even present in the world today where Christians can't get together without fearing that something's going to happen to them. That somebody's going to come in and cause them great harm. There are places in the world where it is illegal to even speak the name Jesus. To even own a Bible is illegal. And Jesus said, of whom much is given, of the same, much shall be required. See, he's given us these opportunities to meet together. He's given us these opportunities in freedom to study his word without fear of somebody busting in that door and arresting me for owning a Bible. He's given you these opportunities. Let's not take these opportunities for granted, but let's use every opportunity that we have to get together to do so. Let's use every opportunity that we have to get into his word to do so. Let's take every opportunity that we have to tell somebody else, hey, God loves you. Let me tell you what Jesus can do in your life. I know he can do it for you because he did it for me. Let's not take those opportunities for soul winning. Take, advantage, or take, uh, take them for granted. 
But let's take advantage of what God has given us. Because what God has given us is the advantage that we can then turn and give to somebody else. To glorify God. To reach somebody else for him. And as we remember those things, let's pray as we close Bible study tonight. Lord, we do thank you for every opportunity that we have to live for you because of that opportunity that you've given us for life through you. We pray that by that faith that we have in you unto eternal life, salvation and forgiveness of sins, that by that faith we can also exercise the strength of your spirit to reach somebody else for you. That we can exercise that strength of spirit to not make excuses, but to come together with your people to worship you. We love you, God. And as you've given us so much, help us to be appreciative and to show our appreciation. Just as we live our faith, just as we live our love by the actions that demonstrate those things, let us show our appreciation toward you in taking and using and being thankful for the opportunities that we have to know you, to reach somebody else, and to gather together in your name. And in your name we pray these things. Jesus, amen. amen. God bless you this evening.